All right, today we're going to talk about the New England Southern and Middle Colonies um, in terms of economics, in terms of economy, religion, education. And as I go through each one of them, I'll tell you which are the Southern Colonies. So, and which are the uh, Middle Colonies, which are the New England Colonies. So if we start off with um, Southern Colonies, Southern Colonies, we're talking about Maryland, Virginia, the Carolinas, um, Georgia. So let's talk about the southern colonies first and talk about crops and land. Southern colonies had a climate advantage. They could grow exotic stable crops uh, that were prized in England. For example, tobacco. In Virginia, tobacco production in 1619 was about 20,000 pounds. But within 70 years, it's 18 million pounds of tobacco being shipped to Europe. Smoking was all the rage in Europe. And by the way, there were people who knew it was bad. I think I've mentioned once before that James I called it that stinking weed. Also, Southern Woods produced a harvest of lumber and naval stores, which we, when we talk about naval stores, we're about tar, pitch, turpentine used to build ships. Uh, in fact, North Carolina led in the production of naval stores, hence the nickname the Tar Hills. So the South are going to have very large plantations. And the reason they have these large plantations is that tobacco and later cotton uh, tended to burn out the soil. And so what you'd have to have is a large plantation so you could rotate where you were planting because you would burn out your soil so fast. You're not going to see in the South, a lot of major cities. The biggest city is going to be Charleston. It's going to be about 12,000 people. People are going to be sort of spread out. Well, when you have a plantation economy, you depend upon manual labor. We talked about this earlier. Early on, a lot of people were indentured servants, right? Uh, these were people that were um, brought over, somebody paid their way, and then they had to work off that debt. And then once they worked off that debt, they would get you know, land themselves, which they rarely did because they died. Or if, if you're a woman and you were pregnant and then you, you could not work for a while, then that's adding to your indentured servitude. Your child would be an indentured servant as they had to take care of your child for a certain period of time. But working off the debt was very difficult to do and most died before they could work off the debt. So uh, the problem becomes that in England, the economy starts getting better, less people are trying to come over to the new world. So that means they're going to shift, and this is going to be a shift to slavery. Slavery had long since been dying in, in Europe. We already talked about in 1619 that Dutch ships drop off the first African Americans here. Some were treated as indentured servants, some went on their own lands, um, but some were slaves. Soon, land availability began to shrink. And so, again, less indentured servants, more slaves being import imported. And by the 1700s, 20% of the country was African-American, which is a higher percentage than it is today. In South Carolina, a majority of the population was black. Uh, now, slaves came from very diverse areas of Africa. They're very culturally different. Uh, uh, different. Uh, they're, as I, I say to people often, how many countries are there in Africa? And I think there's like two, there's you know over 50. And what they would do is they take these slaves and they would pack them in slave ships for a four to six week journey across the Atlantic known as the Middle Passage. Uh, uh, and often one out of every seven died uh, because you're packed lying down often uh, uh, in your own excrement. You couldn't get up and move except uh, briefly to get on deck and then back down again. And so people died. Uh, now, if we're looking at places like South Carolina, where they had difficult time, um, where in South Carolina, where 60% of the population was, was black, then why didn't they revolt, right? They're the majority. Well, there are several reasons for this. Uh, one, they're unfamiliar with the terrain. Where would you go? Uh, their whites were numerous and had guns. And we're going to see this uh, often in slave revolts. Is when slave revolts are happening, usually one of the first things they do is try to get the armory, get the guns. And revolts were brutally suppressed. The Stono uprising in 1739 um, enraged planters chopped off the heads of 20 slaves and put them on pikes as a warning to others. And, and we're going to come back to this in, in greater detail in the uh, unit four, but these slaves will form a new identity, identity as African-American. They're going to be very influential in music, folklore, religion. Uh, in religion, they're going to combine traditional African beliefs with Christianity. 
they certainly identify with Christianity and the theme of redemption. Um, and then early on, slave families were discouraged by slave owners, uh, but soon seen as a stabilizing factors uh, that it was much more difficult to try to escape uh, if you were uh, with a family. Uh, and slave families will uh, develop differently. Uh, men and women are treated more as equals because they had to do the same work. Um, in fact, uh, the women in the slave household had more power or, or, or equality than you would find in the planter with the planter's wife. So why have slavery? Uh, or how do you justify slavery? That's the question. Uh, and what they're going to do is going to use racism as slavery uh, as the way to justify slavery because you know that it's wrong to enslave another human being. So how do you get around that by saying they're not really human beings and therefore you can enslave them? Now, the ruling class of the South is going to be the gentry. Um, this is the, um, the golden age of the tidewater gentry throughout Virginia and South Carolina. They, they pattern their lives uh, after English gentlemen, they wanted to be like the English. They tried to build huge estates, um, but they were always in debt. They were always borrowing money from England so they could keep up with the latest London fashions. They wanted the latest London clothes. They wanted to make sure they had the latest saddles, the latest plates. They read, they read um, English newspapers. Um, they'll send their kids off to English schools. And so southern colonies, um, at least these, these, these um, gentry folks, are going to be uh, in debt most of the time, and they're going to be indebted to foreign capital often. Uh, you can often read a lot about this with George Washington. As George Washington is writing letters complaining that the clothes that he's getting from England are not the latest fashion. Now, religion. There's not a lot of religion in the South at this time. Church membership to residents was about one out of every 15 people. Part of the reason was people too spread out. There was, there really was no centralized control. Uh, and that's why, and we'll come back to this later, when they talk about the South's peculiar institution, meaning slavery, is because they didn't have a strong church institution. They didn't have a strong government institution. And the one institution that really united white Southerners was slavery. So here in the South, um, people did not like being chastised from the pulpit. Uh, if you were a minister, uh, you could be removed from your job if you uh, started talking about the sins that were favored by the men of the parish, gambling, uh, horse racing, um, uh, drinking. They would say, look, uh, go pick some other uh, sins to tell us about, but um, we like keep, we're like going to keep doing those. And you're not going to see a lot of education early on in most of the South. Uh, you, what you needed to know was how to add and somehow sign your name. That's about it. You were primarily farmers. So let's switch over to New England. Now, in New England, you're never going to see the head right system take hold. Remember, we, we talked about getting, uh, if you came over, you got 50 acres of land, and you, every servant you brought, you got additional 50 acres of land. That's not how New England works. New England works with, uh, you get a group of people and you would form a township. Uh, so you get a, a group of settlers, they would go to the general court and say, we'd like to form a town. And so the general court would give them a certain amount of acres and they would build a town. Now in the town, you would get a certain amount of land depending upon your social status or your wealth. You'd get a little bit more land, uh, but the houses were fairly close together. Uh, and every, every town that had at least 50 people had to have a school, they had a church. And so the reason that they're close together is so that they can protect themselves from Indian attack and they're also making sure that everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing religiously and making sure that you were going to church. Uh, this will play a part in, in political science uh, in terms of how you view the role of government. And you know, in these New England states, and when we're talking New England, we're talking about Connecticut, New Hampshire, uh, uh, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts. Uh, in these these places, um, they create what we call a moralistic political culture where government's supposed to provide for the common good. And when you look at the settlement pattern, it's a little bit different here where you'd bring in uh, you know, a group of people and form your town and you'd all work together to have a, a good, strong community. As opposed to say Texas, when you wanted to settle in Texas later on, you'd get 160 acres by yourself and your job was just to go out and make it by yourself. 
And that leads to what we call an individualistic political culture, but that's government. We don't need to know that, uh, about that. Now, they parceled out the lands in their township uh, based on your social status, but some land would be reserved for um, common pasture or for future settlers if somebody else wanted to come to town. Uh, these common areas, you could put your cows out to uh, and it would be used by everybody. That's why it was common. In fact, if you were to go to Boston today, the major park in downtown Boston is Boston Commons because it was the common area. So let's talk about economics in, in the New England colonies. The soil was hard to till. Uh, it's very rocky soil. It's six, it took 60 days, two months to clear one acre of rocks. That's how many... Um, uh, that's how rocky the soil was. And if you were to go uh, to New England today and you go to Massachusetts and you drive through some of the smaller towns, you can see that a lot of the walls between houses are built with rocks. Um, so 60 days to clear one acre of rocks, it would take you a while. And the growing season was short. It wasn't like it was in the South. So you can't grow uh, tobacco here. You can grow barley, you can grow wheat and oats, you can have some cattle and some pigs. Uh, but primarily you're, uh, what you're gonna see here is that the, the land is gonna be converted for shipbuilding. They had a lot of tall pines and uh, you had abundant fishing grounds and they could fish for cod, mackerel, halibut. Uh, whales were plentiful. Uh, you know, whales were good for uh, oil, uh, lighting and lubrication uh, and ambergris, which was a, a perfume. Well, this fishing industry spelled, uh, spurred the development of shipbuilding, which means that we are building more ships and we're having more uh, contact with countries across the Atlantic. Now, the New England colonies are gonna be very materialistic as they traded for goods from around the world. Uh, and by the end of the 1600s, America's part of the great North Atlantic commercial network, trade with Great Britain, West Indies, and Americans traded illegally with Spain, France, Holland, Portugal, and their colonies. Now, when I say illegally, that's because the mercantile system was in effect. Uh, and this is the idea that most people believed at the time was that the wealth of the world was fixed in the amount of gold and silver there was. And your job as a country was to um, get the most of that gold and silver. And you did that by exporting more than you imported. And you also did it by having colonies. Colonies were a source of raw material, like the, the American colonies were, and the mother country, England, was a place for finished goods. So England would uh, take raw materials from the colonies, manufacture goods, and send them back to the colonies for sale. Now, obviously, raw materials are not as valuable as um, finished goods, right? Because if I give you several logs and you go, okay, I've got a couple of logs, there's not much to it. Uh, then you take those logs and make chairs out of it. Then the chairs are very valuable. Uh, Karl Marx would say that's a surp the surplus value is that the value you put in with your labor. So the Americans are always gonna have an unfavorable trade balance, right? They're sending raw materials, but they're having to buy manufactured goods, but they're not supposed to be trading with anybody else because England wants all the trade to go to them. Otherwise that, that money is going other places. And that's why it was illegal for the, the American colonies to trade with the French or the Portuguese. Um, so this is gonna lead to the Americans really being um, uh, smugglers often. They are gonna go, um, uh, trade with places they're not supposed to and try to get around English law. They're also part of the so-called triangle trade uh, that you've heard of for or triangular trade. And there are several different versions of the triangular trade. Um, in one version, New England ships run to Africa for slaves. Then they take the slaves to the, uh, on the middle passage to the West Indies. And there they sell the slaves, they get some gold and they buy molasses in the West Indies. Uh, which they made run. And then they would take the rum back to Africa for slaves, then run the whole trip all over again. So it's rum, uh, rum made in New England, take to Africa, trade for slaves, slaves taken to the West Indies uh, for gold and molasses. The molasses used to make more rum, and then they make the trip all back over again. And this is a good point uh, made by Southerners when um, New Englanders start complaining about slavery. Uh, 
they certainly point out that, yeah, you complain about slaves and you don't own slaves, but you certainly got rich on the slave trade, which is true. Uh, there was a lot, a lot of hypocrisy here as well. So uh, that's one version of, uh, of triangle trade. There are several versions of the triangular trade. The effect of this trade is the colonies are always short of hard currency, actual gold and silver. So most colonies issued bills of credit, which is a promise of payment later. That's one reason why we get the term dollar bill. So let's talk about religion. Now, often when we think about the Puritans, we think of them very strict, you know, straightforward people, but they're not hostile to all pleasures. The upper classes love to dance. They would wear colorful clothes, drink lots of rum. They thought drink was fine as long as you didn't do too much drinking. If you were a local drunk, they might put a big letter D on you for you to wear. Uh, they believed in moderation of everything. Uh, they're not prudes. They're open to the ideas about sex because the, the, the colony had to reproduce to keep going. Uh, you could, the church could expel members for not satisfying their spouse's sexual needs because you had to produce children to keep the colony going. Uh, there was lots of adultery because early on there was a shortage of women in the colonies. Um, so let's make sure we rehash this one last time here. Puritans are those uh, people in Massachusetts who wanted to purify the, the Anglican church, get rid of the Catholic remnants but still remain loyal to the Church of England. But then you also had pilgrims, which were separatists who didn't want to be part of the uh, Church of England. Well, you're going to eventually see social tensions occur even uh, in the New England colonies because of poverty, disparities of wealth, and availability of lands. And Puritans persecuted Baptists, Quakers. I think I mentioned that you can go to Boston Commons today uh, and see where they were hanging Quakers. Uh, but eventually, Massachusetts becomes a royal colony. Uh, it was originally not a royal colony, and now the Puritans have to tolerate all sorts of religious dissent. They have to tolerate everybody. Which brings us to the Salem witch trials. And uh, I'm not going to say a whole lot about this. Uh, there are a lot of good books. The, the Devil and Ship of uh, uh, Woman's a great book. Um, Gosh, I can't think of the name of the other one I was going to mention to you. Uh, but uh, Salem Possessed is another good book. Uh, the Samuel Strauss had 300 New Englanders accused of witchcraft. Most of them were lower class, middle-aged, marginal women. More than 30 were hanged. Um, and most of the responsible members of the clergy opposed the witch trials. Now, you know, here's, here's one of the things that I find interesting is that people say, well, history should just teach the facts. Okay. Um, about 30 people are hanged at the same witch trials and then they end it. Okay, what does that tell us? It doesn't tell us a whole lot, does it? But it's, it's, it's more interesting to find out why. Why was the witch trials? I mean, there wasn't really this belief in witchery at this time in, in Europe to the same extent here. Well, there are several different theories. One says it's a, a battle of values between the farming community and the Port of Salem. Uh, Others have argued that it was, and not very successfully, that it was tainted grain. Uh, others argue that it was uh, poorer residents seeking revenge against wealthier residents. Uh, the book, uh, The Devil in the Shape of a Woman, points out it's mainly women who uh, were fairly independent or they were outspoken, and this is a way of, of, of getting back at them. Uh, there was another book written by a Cornell professor who would argue that um, this is over uh, um, a failed military mission into Maine to defeat the Indians and tensions were still high over that. But for whatever reasons, um, the jails start filling up because once you start saying, hey, Satan, you point at anybody and say that person's a devil worshiper and they're in trouble. It's it's equivalent to, and if you've seen Arthur Miller's play, The Crucible, uh, he's, he writes that play during the time of the, of the Salem, I mean, of the Red Scare in the 1950s, that uh, you could get back at somebody by accusing them of being a communist. Uh, and so they would do that. Well, during the next 10 months, you know, like the jails fell out uh, and they hanged several people. One man, stubborn Giles Corey, that's a good name to have, was pressed to death with stones. They would just keep putting more and more stones on you until you were crushed. Um, colonial leaders are worried that the situation is getting out of control. 
the governor intervenes when his wife is accused of being a witch. He goes, okay, we've got to stop now. Uh, he disbands the courts and orders others released from jail. We'll talk about this in unit two, uh, or actually unit three. Uh, we'll talk about Nathaniel Hawthorne and uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne who wrote the Scarlet Letter and the House of the Seven Gables. Uh, one of his ancestors is a judge of the Salem Witch Trials, which sort of haunts him. Uh, education was important here uh, in the New England colonies. You had your first uh, college, Harvard. Uh, any, any town that had 50 or more people had to have a school. So education, uh, important here in the New England colonies. So that brings us to the middle colonies and that's New York, New Jersey, Delaware, uh, Pennsylvania. And I'm not gonna say a whole lot here, except that it's, it's sort of a mix. Um, but uh, in some places, it's an economic mix where you have some elements from the both Southern and New England colonies. You have the same crops in New England, but more bountiful. You can, you can grow more. Uh, and so uh, you can grow more wheat and barley and you sell a lot of that to the West Indies or Southern plantations. Um, they also have some really good access to fur trade. They do a lot of commerce. Some places they do the head right system, others they do not. Uh, they do have an education, but mainly in the form of trade schools. Uh, you do see some large cities, but also a lot of rural areas. It's an ethnic mix with, you've got the Dutch, Swedes, Finns, Germans, Scotch, Irish, uh, people from Ireland, uh, you had people from all over the place. And then again, you also had a mix of, of religion. In some places, religion was strong and out in the rural areas, not so much. And we'll talk more about these rural areas later on. Real quickly, before we, we, we drop off for this lecture, let's talk about colonial cities. Cities that grow the fastest are going to be port cities. And this is going to be true really throughout most of American history, if you're near a major waterway, you're going to grow pretty fast. Interestingly enough, uh, Dallas uh, is the largest city that's not on a major waterway. So think about your large cities, and they're all near a lake, right, or they're all near a, a huge river. Well, by the end of the colonial period, Philadelphia was America's largest city. It had 30,000 people, and it was second only to London in the British Empire. Now think about that, 30,000. If you got 30,000 in the Cowboy Stadium for a game, would you think there was anybody in there? Probably not. New York had 25,000, Boston 16,000, Charleston 12,000, Newport Rhode Island 11,000. Now the merchants were the upper crust. The middle class were craftsmen, retailers, innkeepers. The bottom class were sailors, unskilled workers. And of course, cities create problems. Um, you're gonna need paved streets. Uh, Philadelphia, one of the first cities to have a, a paved street with bricks and you can go and see some of those today, uh, and street lighting. You're gonna need traffic laws. You're gonna need garbage pickup. You're gonna need building codes because fires could destroy a city pretty quickly. Uh, you need a police department. You need a fire department. Now, early on the fire department was, uh, you all had a bucket. Every family had a bucket. And when the fire alarm came out, you got to throw the bucket. And then of course there'd be a long line and you would just be tossing the water with the bucket. Um, wealthier people, and if you've ever in Boston go to the uh, the customs building where the Boston massacre takes place. There's a little museum in there and you can see some of these buckets that the wealthier people were able to sort of uh, uh, trick out their buckets with, you know, designs and nice things on them. You also had to do re um, uh, relief supplies for the poor. And then communication between cities was difficult. There were no paved roads outside the city until the 18, uh, 1790s. You had to travel by foot or horse. Uh, the post offices at first were non-existence. I mean, if you wanted to um, get a letter out, you'd have to find a ship captain and say, hey, I'm gonna give you some money. Would you make sure that this letter gets to so-and-so in New York City if you were in Boston or somebody who was on a horseback going? You'd pay them that way. Uh, it's not until the 1700s we start seeing the post office come into play. This will also lead to the rise of newspapers by 1745. Okay, so we're gonna stop there. And next time we are gonna talk about uh, the Enlightenment and the Great Awakening.